Good morning, friends. The Lord be with you. It is good to be gathered this morning to bring our worship to, uh, to Christ and all that he has done. Uh, we welcome you to worship this morning. If you could remember to sign the blue friendship pads that are on the seats beside you and pass those down, we'd appreciate that so that we can know that you were here in worship today. And if you are joining us online, welcome to you as well. We would ask that you would sign the virtual friendship pad uh, for the same reason, so we can know that you are joining us this morning. Uh, we are back down in Fellowship Hall, as you can see, and that is because our organ is under far more construction than it even was last week. Uh, if you go up there and check that out, it's, uh, it's really neat to see the progress being made there. Uh, the wall that we recognize so well is gone. It's torn down, and we're rebuilding it uh, in a different space to allow for more room for the, uh, the pipes that are going to go back there. Um, I would encourage you to just go up to the sanctuary after worship and check that out and uh, be appreciative, as we all are, of uh, all that God is doing through that progression. This morning, we have the privilege of uh, hearing Bethany Harbaugh preach for us. Uh, she will be bringing us the word of God today. We're appreciative of all her preparation for us this morning. Uh, also, we will do communion. We will observe the Lord's Supper. Uh, so we'll do an intinction-like style where we come up the center aisle and go off to the sides. Uh, but if you are online and want to join us for communion, we'd invite you to that. Uh, just be sure to prepare some, some bread, and if you have juice, uh, feel free to join us in that way. Uh, also, at the 11, or sorry, 11.30, the 8.30 service, we commissioned our um, junior high mission team as they go on to Niagara uh, to do their mission work there. We prayed for them at the 8.30 service. Uh, continue to just be praying for them as they leave tomorrow for that trip uh, and all the work that they're going to be doing out there. Keep them in mind as you pray this week. Uh, also, in the upper gathering room, uh, you already know this, but just reminders about the uh, olive wood creations from Bethlehem that are up there. We are selling those to raise money for Bashara and uh, Sharuk Salsa, who are uh, Palestinian Christians, uh, raising money for them in that way. So feel free to check those out in the upper gathering room. And also, there are plenty of free books still out there that we're trying to get rid of. So make your way up there, grab some free books also. Uh, I want to invite uh, Liz to come on up and share about Go Camp. Good morning. So VBS was a huge success. We're gearing up for our second camp of the summer, which is called Go to Camp. Um, so it's kind of a play on words. So in culture, kids are told to be the goat, the greatest of all time. GOAT camp is a reverse of that, where it stands for giving our abilities and talents. So the whole idea of the camp is to just instill the truth into kids that um, their worth doesn't come from their performance and that the gifts and talents they have is actually meant to glorify God and not themselves. So they'll spend all week learning about God and learning about Him as the greatest of all time. And then they'll spend the second half of the morning um, really just engulfed in subject areas that they choose. So they can choose between STEM, cooking, sports, arts and crafts, and dance and music. So they'll sign up for that. I encourage you, if your kids have not signed up yet, to do that soon because spots are limited because of the subject focuses. So cooking is already full. Um, a couple of the areas have one or two spots left. So if your child is interested in that, um, sign them up quickly so that they can get a spot there. Um, the second thing is we could use help um, volunteering. Even if you can only come for one or two days of the week, um, we would love to have you, especially if you have any expertise in any of those subject areas that I mentioned. Um, it's great for kids to see adults glorifying God in their workforce, um, and so we invite you to do that. If you are not able to be here for that week, that's totally fine. We appreciate your prayers. But also in the back corner of this room and up in the gathering room, there are goat tails that have items that we need. Um, some of those items might seem really weird, um, but we need them for STEM or cooking or creative corner. Um, so we'd really appreciate it if you would help by donating any of those goods. Thanks. And James Powell has an announcement, uh, announcement about missions for us. Good morning, all. If you or your family have been uh, prayerful or seeking a practical opportunity for you to show Christ's love for others here in the Pittsburgh area, then uh, we'd like to invite you to join us, the Elfin Wild 
missions team is joining with one of our local partners to serve a meal for um, residents and those at the Pleasant Valley Shelter, part of the Northside Common Ministries in Pittsburgh. We have a meal planned to feed 30 to 40 at their kitchen. Uh, we're looking for volunteers that would like to help with buying and preparing the food, uh, perhaps also serving at the shelter kitchen. Um, as mentioned before, this is going to be happening on Thursday, July 18th. It'll be going on from 5.30 to 8.30 p.m. We would meet here at the church to prep, and then some or all would travel to serve dinner at the shelter in the north side. So if you'd like to be part of this outreach, uh, either in preparing or serving or purchasing items um, in any of these, please talk to me over the next week or so. Um, just stop me. Also, uh, there's a, this summary is along the back side there next to the tissues under the air conditioner. Um, my contact information is on that. So reach out to me either through phone or email um, if you'd like to be part. Thank you. Friends, continue to just be prayerful for one another. Uh, be prayerful for the family of Carol Stoddy. Carol passed away on Friday this week. Um, so there will be a memorial service, uh, but arrangements are being made for that if you're interested in attending there. Uh, also be praying for our brother uh, Dave Jameson. There is some good news with that. He got results from his biopsy and uh, nothing has metastasized. And so uh, that is a, a great blessing. With that, though, he will have a surgery to remove his kidney. And uh, there is a lot of recovery that goes into that. That will occur at the either the end of July or the beginning of August. So be praying for Dave and Sherry as they endure that as well. Uh, with that, friends, let's stand and greet one another. Share the peace of Christ with someone new this morning.
Let me turn your attention to our bulletin this morning. Our call to worship is from Psalm 95. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Praise the Lord. Let's stand and sing our first song together. God of creation, we are always humbled to come before you with our praise. Lord, every day that we are able to gather under your name is a blessing. And every day that we are able to pause and acknowledge your greatness, we are thankful. We are not gathered here because we are forced or because we are obligated or even to avoid the guilt of not being here. But Lord, we are here right now because you are worthy of it. You are worthy of our prayer. You are worthy of our songs. You are worthy of our offerings, our hearts, and our time. God, there is no other who we can come to with such joy, because you alone are our Savior. By the blood of your Son, we are able to have communion with you and be a part of your flock in Christ. And so we are here today, in your presence, asking for your grace even as we worship. Be among us, Lord. Inscribe your word on our hearts and equip us to be disciples and ambassadors of your light. Work in us today as we bring you honor and glory. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.
to confession this morning comes from Romans chapter 6. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died, in, who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. Please join me in the unison prayer of confession. Forgiving God, we know we fall short. We try to build ourselves up through worldly accomplishments and become proud when we succeed. We promote our own agendas instead of submitting to your will. And we often try to get ahead at the expense of others. Forgive us, God. Teach us to seek you first and always. Give us humble hearts of service and love. Through Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. The assurance of pardon continues in Romans chapter 6. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Friends, believe and receive the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. seated. Please pray with me as we come to our time of offering. Heavenly Father, as we gather here today with work underway above us, we're thankful for the generosity of the many people here and gone whose financial gifts allow us to repair the organ, remodel the chancel, replace exterior doors, and otherwise improve and maintain your be beacon on the hill, and to further your kingdom in big and small ways. We thank you for your abundant generosity to us. As we give today, open our hearts to be more unselfish in thought and deed, reflecting your love. Bless these offerings and bless us as cheerful givers. Amen.
please remain standing as we affirm our faith together using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the world you have entrusted to us, for love and friendship, for our gifts and our successes, for our many blessings, and even for the things that challenge us that we might not understand. We thank you for life itself and for each precious day. On this holiday especially, we thank you for our country and for the people who envisioned it and the people who built it and those who defend it. Most of all, we thank you for the knowledge of your love through your word, through prayer, and through your assurance of eternal life. Please watch over the leaders and teens who are headed to Niagara Falls. Keep them safe as your work is done in them and through them. We bring to you in prayer people who are sick or in pain, troubled, lonely, hungry, angry, lost or empty, people who are in danger and live without hope. We lift up these things that weigh on our hearts and the things we don't understand in a world that can be harsh. We pray for those we know and hold dear, and for those we don't know, that each person will know you are with them, and they are not and cannot be separated from your love. Together, we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, today we are going to look at one of Paul's letters, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Um, so if you have a Bible, go ahead and turn there with me. And if not, it should be on a blue insert in your bulletin, and you can follow along that way also. Now, at the time that Paul writes this letter, he has known the people in the Corinthian church for about five years, give or take. And his relationship with them first started when he spent 18 months with them there, teaching the people about Jesus and helping to plant a church in that city. And you can read more about that in Acts chapter 18. Now, even after God called Paul away from Corinth, he cared so much about these people that he continued writing them letters, uh, visiting them on occasion, and offering encouragement and correction when needed. And at the place that we will start reading today, Paul has received 
upsetting news that there were some teachers who entered the church who were boasting about themselves and they were full of wrong teaching and the people were okay with that. So Paul wanted to address these issues. But since the church was listening to these teachers largely as a result of their own boasting, Paul decided to play along a little bit, but only to a point in order to show how ridiculous and empty their message and their boasting was. So as we come to God's word today, let us pray. Change us, God, through the reading and hearing of your word. We know that your word is true, and so we come prepared to be challenged. Help us to receive your word with humility and direct us as we live as your disciples. Through Christ, our Savior, we pray. Amen. So this is 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and the first 10 verses. I must go on boasting. Although there is nothing to be gained, I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man who in Christ 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible things, things that no one is permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself except about my weaknesses. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain, so no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say, or because of these surpassingly great revelations. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, there seem to be two main concerns here for Paul. And the first deals with the teachers and their boasting. And the second has to do with the hearts of the people in Corinth who were so willing to follow. As for the teachers, or the super apostles, as Paul jokingly called them, their message was empty of the gospel of Jesus and full instead of themselves. And they built themselves up in a couple of different ways. And the first was by knocking Paul down. For example, back in chapter 10, verse 10, they accused Paul of being weighty and forceful in his letter, but in person, they claimed he was unimpressive and his speaking amounted to nothing. So while these teachers worked to undermine Paul, they at the same time bragged about their own greatness how well-trained and qualified they were to be preaching. And Paul hoped that through this letter, it would help the church see that this self-centered boasting was actually foolish. And in order to prove the foolishness of this self-promotion, Paul plays along and does a little of his own boasting. But pay close attention to what he boasts about. In chapter 11, his list of accomplishments in ministry is not 
gathering large crowds or keeping a tally of how many people he pointed to Jesus. Instead, the list, starting in verse 21, includes things like beatings, imprisonments, hunger, and thirst. And then when we reach chapter 12, which we just read, he moves on to the hot topic of the day, which was visions and revelations, something that these super apostles had been recounting for the church. Now, this kind of experience was not uncommon, and we see them all throughout Scripture, one example being Peter's vision in Acts chapter 10 that paved the way for the inclusion of Gentiles to be part of the Christian church. But the false teachers here used their visions as an opportunity to boast in their own unique relationship with God and how it gave them special insights that others had not received. And so Paul leans into this foolishness to a degree when he cryptically talks about a man he knows who was given a vision from God. But we learn in verses 6 and 7 that Paul is referring to himself. And by referring to himself in the third person, he's making the point that he's not the important one. Paul doesn't even give us the content of his vision because it's beside the point. He doesn't want to spend time building himself up when it should all be about Jesus. He says in verse 6, I refrain so no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say. Walking through the halls at our elementary school, you can often see posters of what kids want to be when they grow up. NFL players for the boys, dancers, singers, and actresses for the girls, and a handful of YouTubers thrown into both. Those are the people that we see, the ones who get rich and popular. They have a large following. And then when we get older and those dreams fade, we realize we might not ever be rich or popular. Our lives don't look anything like what we thought they would. And so we blame others for our hardships and look for someone with worldly answers to our problems. We seek out the people at the top, the ones who have claimed that they can do it all themselves. Then they're the ones that we believe are strong enough to offer solutions and follow through. But this brings us to the second issue that Paul is addressing, the hearts of the people in the church who were following those who were boastful and full of empty teaching. They knew where the focus should have been. They had been taught it. They, um, Acts 18 says that throughout the initial year and a half with the Corinthian church, it says Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. So imagine how heartbroken he must have been to hear that they had been so easily persuaded by teaching that was contrary to what they had learned. He says to them in chapter 11, verse 4, if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus we preached, or if you receive a different spirit from the spirit you received, or a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it easily enough. So after helping this church become rooted in the gospel, the good news about Jesus, the message of salvation on which they grounded their lives, he was concerned that they were giving it up and turning to a message that was empty. So what is it about their hearts and ours 
that we so easily abandon our first love and instead become convinced that others can give us something better. This is where it becomes hard for us because our culture values and expects independence, self-sufficiency, and strength, providing for ourselves and denying our failures. But the word of God challenges us to think of our failures as a conduit for God's power. Paul had good worldly reason to boast in a lot of things. Before he met Christ, he was a Pharisee, a teacher of the law, and he was good at following it himself. Additionally, he was so passionate about what he believed that he set out to persecute and imprison those who practice differently, in particular, Christians. It was a very honorable thing for him to do as a Jewish leader. And yet, Jesus sought out Paul and reversed all of that for him. Paul, who could supposedly boast in doing all of the right things for his religion, was shown by Jesus that his accomplishments and the status that he had gained were actually worth nothing. All of his good works would never be enough to save himself. Only Jesus could save him. And so his life was no longer to be lived, to build himself up, but rather to point to Jesus. And in order to keep Paul's eyes fixed on Jesus, Paul wrote here that God gave him what he calls a thorn in the flesh, something that reminds him of his weakness, because that weakness points him to his need for Jesus. Now, there's a lot of speculation out there about what that thorn is for Paul, but we're just never told. And that's fine because, again, Paul is not the point. Jesus is. Paul says that although he pleaded with the Lord three times to take that thorn away, God spoke to him and said, My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Paul didn't want to be weak, but God found it necessary for Paul in order to show Christ to the world. We may feel similarly to Paul. We'd prefer for God to take away any sign of our inability. inability. If we were to acknowledge our weakness, it would show that we're vulnerable, prone to failure, and imperfect. And why would we want to admit any of that? It's because that weakness points us and others to God, the one who is perfect and faithful and strong. We have no power on our own. No one does except for God. He created the whole world simply by speaking. He has chosen and preserved his people all throughout time and demonstrates his power over and over through miracles, like parting the Red Sea and leading his people out of Egypt, and then providing manna for them in the desert, and the list goes on. God can do anything. And yet, we quickly turn elsewhere when others claim to have solutions. Maybe that's even because, to some, God's acts of power appear to them to be weak and foolish. God himself was born into this world as Jesus, a vulnerable baby. He lived a sinless life, revealing to the world that he was the Messiah, 
who had come to fix the ultimate problem that we are all looking for answers to, sin, the sin in our own hearts and the sin in the world. But in order to do that, Jesus humbled himself in obedience to the will of God the Father, and he was beaten and killed. He suffered the ultimate humiliation of crucifixion, and through what the world perceived as weakness was instead a great display of his power. Jesus beat death and was raised to life, something no one else could do, and he could do it because he is God, our Savior. So if we were to choose someone to boast about, Christ is the one. When we honestly examine ourselves, our shortcomings are obvious, especially those thorns that plague us over and over and won't go away. But have we ever considered that those things that display our frailty may be the greatest resource we have to display God's glory. Because when we admit that we are not strong enough to accomplish anything on our own, nor is anyone else, we can point to the one who has already proven that he has the strength to do anything, even remove sin. And that is why Paul says we can delight in our weaknesses. Our weakness in the hands of our God will help people see that he is the one who deserves all the attention. Jesus is the one worthy of boasting about. Let us pray. God, may you be glorified for we know that you alone are worthy. We pray that you would give us hearts of humility so that we do not try to take the attention off of you. Set our hearts on you and help us be quick to tell others about the love you have for them and the salvation you offer. Through Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. Scripture says that people will come from east and west, north and south, to sit together at the table in the kingdom of God. This is the Lord's table. It is not Elfenwild's table or a Presbyterian table. It is the Lord's table. And he invites all who place their trust in him to come. Let us pray. God, you have called us together as one body in Christ, and we come to you, our source of hope and salvation, giving thanks for your perfect life, your death in our place, and your resurrection and gift of new life for us. As we take the bread and cup today, we ask that you increase our faith, and change us into your people, made holy by the blood of Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Our Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, was sitting at a table with his disciples, and he took bread. And after giving thanks to God, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after su supper, Jesus took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Every time you drink it, do this remembering me. And so every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the saving death of our risen Lord until he comes 
again. I invite you to come forward to receive communion beginning with the front rows and coming down the center aisle. You may eat the bread and drink the juice before returning to your seats along the side. And there are bowls that you can put your empty cups in as you return. Um, there are also people available. There's someone who um, can come around if you are not able to come forward. Simply raise your hand and we will come to you. Let's pray. God, we thank you that through word and sacrament, you have given us your son, Jesus, who is the true bread from heaven, our hope and our salvation. Give us strength and courage in our daily living to be faithful and filled with the joy of Christ so that others might know your hope and give you praise. In the name of our perfect Savior, we pray. Amen. Let us stand and sing our final song together.
So as we boast, let us boast in the Lord. He is the only one worthy to boast about because he is our savior. May the love of God the Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you today, tomorrow, and always. Amen. <laughs>